I'm your host, Liza Lawrence. This is episode 13, A Child Shall Lead Them. Welcome to Wonders and Miracles podcast, where we celebrate miraculous moments in everyday lives. I'm your host, Liza Lawrence, a wife, mother, teacher, and miracle lover. If you're new to this podcast, here's what we do here. Each week on Miracle Monday, we celebrate awe-inspiring true stories from regular people like you and me. People who have experienced something surprising and wonderful that could be considered the work of a divine source. My desire is to help us recognize God's hand and His love in our lives. Because the more miracles we notice, the more miracles happen. Thanks for listening to the show. Now let's celebrate wonders and miracles together. In the scripture, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6, at the end it says, A child shall lead them. A Facebook group called Gifted Moms says, While we try to teach our children all about life, our children teach us what life is all about. All right, so the episode today features two stories where you will see examples where the child leads the way. It's interesting, this morning I had been pondering what to title the episode, and every morning I do a practice right as I'm waking up. I say a prayer, and my prayer is very specific. I'll say, Father, what will you have me do today? And it can be targeted towards a goal I'm working on, like... Father, what will you have me do today for my podcast or for this child or for my class, my university class that I teach? I teach human development. What's interesting is our brain is in the theta brain wave right at the cusp of waking up and falling to sleep. And this brain wave is our most intuitive brain wave. It's our most spiritually open time. And so I say it before as I'm just waking up. So this morning I prayed, Father, what will you have me do for my podcast? What should I title it? What should the theme be? And a song popped into my mind that I have not heard for years and years. And it was an old Whitney Houston song. And my younger listeners might not remember her. (laughs) But the phrase, I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way popped into my mind. And right away I knew, oh, That is the title and the theme of this episode. And in this episode, you will hear two stories. The first, a mother's journey with her fetus being diagnosed with hydrocephalus and the tough decision to abort the baby or to finish the pregnancy with a 50 to 90% chance of having a stillborn. We'll also hear of a divinely guided three-year-old that helped rescue a couple in need. Both super inspiring stories and Whitney Houston's theme song was running through my mind to set the stage for this episode. Thanks for joining me, but first, a plug for our sponsor, Meditations on the Mount. So Meditations on the Mount are Bible-based meditations. My husband and I created these, and we really saw a need for Christian meditations. We had been meditating for years, but we're sort of missing the piece where We wanted more divine guidance in our lives, and so we developed these Christian meditations. They're Bible-based guided meditations, and there's one for adults and there's one for children, and they truly are beautiful meditations. A recommendation comes from Rachel. She says, I highly recommend Meditations on the Mount for Children. It has blessed my family's life by helping my children receive greater understanding and light as they face various emotions and challenges and learn to turn to God. And actually, all this month, I'm giving away free Meditations on the Mount albums. Stay tuned to the end to see how you can receive your free Meditations on the Mount. All right, well, let's get started with our guests today. So I'm here with Jesse. This is fun because Jesse was one of my high school friends, and we're reconnecting after what, 23 years? How long is it? <laughs> so this is so fun. 95, 95, 90, 90, 95. <laughs> and you were my campaign leader. Remember when I was running for body <laughs> officer? <laughs> so, all right. Well, Jesse, thank you so much for being on the show. And tell us your story. Yeah. So thank you for the opportunity to share. I think uh, the more stories we share, the more real we feel. 
I think that's super important in this day and age when I think it's easier sometimes to just be isolated. And this story, a little over eight years ago, uh, my husband and I became pregnant with our fourth kiddo. We went in for our 20-week targeted ultrasound. I remember being walked down to a room with an OB that had delivered my third baby. But this ultrasound, he turned the light on, the machine on, looked over and said, hmm, that's a lot of fluid. Oh. <laughs> turned off the machine and stopped talking. He walked me down. I mean, and this is a beautiful women's center. And so he, he walked me down this long, dark hallway to this darker room with women and computers. And there was, you know, many desks in this area. And he sat me in a chair. He said something to the lady across from the computer. She made a phone call and then wrote something on a yellow post-it note, which I think I have somewhere still because it's still just so alarming to me how <laughs> sensitive this was. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so he didn't tell uh, you why you were going there. He just no, said, Come. no, uh, like last words, that's a lot of fluid and uh, uh, walked me down this hall. So uh, the next day I met with a specialist at the hospital and he turned on the ultrasound machine and he looked at some things and then he said, okay, and he turned off the machine and my husband and I waited in a room. He told my husband and I that our baby had a hydrocephalic condition, which hydrocephalus is, you know, Latin for water on the brain. And this was a term I was familiar with, but mm -hmm. certainly when you get pregnant, you're not thinking of these things. You right. think, you know, birth defects are for, you know, other people. Mm -hmm. But Dr. Andrus was the specialist that we were seeing was so, I think he was very kind and very objective. And I appreciated that, that he could be scientific. He wasn't saying things like, oh, all hope is lost. He really laid out for us the severity of Zadok's condition, but it was extreme. And it was certainly, you know, one of the worst cases he'd seen. There was no brain. There was just oh, water. And that's wow. why I think the ultrasound was shut off at my OB's office because there wasn't any brain. And so wow. if there's no brain, there's not uh -huh. a high expectancy of life, let alone quality of life. Dr. Andrus laid out for us that in a typical baby, they should have five millimeters of water and Zadix was already at 24 and a half millimeters <gasps> of fluid. Wow. You know, in this consultation room, he laid this out on the whiteboard for us of 50 to 90% chance that Zadix, if made it to term, would be a vegetable, right? More surgeries to do a shunt, but Dr. Andrus really didn't think Zadig would have one, make it to term with mm -hmm. already a quadrupling of fluid on the brain than what was normal. And second, that if they did have him to term, we could operate on him and he'd have two to four days of life expectancy wow. with this brain surgery. So mm -hmm. it was yucky. <laughs> I didn't like I'll hearing bet. these things. And there was no research to correlate Zadig's condition to a normal life. He could be healthy, but severely retarded. So Garrett and I went home that weekend. We prayed and prayed and prayed. We cried and cried and cried. We met with religious leaders that we trusted and loved. And it's really sweet. And I would just say that when quote unquote bad things happen to you and you open up and, and reach out, you will be so supported, if not consoled by mm -hmm. other people that you never knew had gone through these things. Mm -hmm. So I would say that the first thing I learned was that when you open up to others, others are able to open up to you. And I'm mm -hmm. really appreciative of any opportunity that connects us as humans yeah, um, to that. each other. And this was the case we opened up to what we call a bishop um, and his wife had gone through a similar situation of a birth condition with one of their children and they chose to abort the baby. And I think that's where Garen and I were mm -hmm. landing on with our prayers is that we felt sustained in our decision to abort him. So problem with that <laughs> is that I don't even have my wisdom teeth out because uh -huh. I have a very hard time with medical <laughs> procedures. That's funny. <laughs> and so we had made the decision to abort that and we felt sustained. I will never say comfortable or confident or that it was an answer to our prayers. We just felt sustained in that mm -hmm. decision. It had to have been the biggest decision. I mean, even right. marriage. Aaron and I had known each other two weeks, engaged for uh -huh. two months, and then we were married. At I remember that. Yeah. Just <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, so why fast. not? We found someone. Let's, let's do that. And, uh -huh. and for the kids, hey, yeah, why not? Let's have a kid. 
this one was not a why not. This was a life and yeah. a life that we medically had determined was not going to be successful. And I did not feel that either I didn't have the skills to believe I could do a vegetable. And I really am trying hard not to be insensitive as I share that, that piece of that story because I know amazing, amazing mm-hmm. people who have supported children that have been in bed all their lives. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's so many conditions out there, but we felt sustained in our decision. We chose to abort the baby. However, don't get this kind of news on a weekend because you send all weekend thinking about uh, it. And yes. where do you turn? You don't know a doctor, so you look on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> and that was horrible to look up. What is the procedure of an abortion? And where do we need to go? And clinics we needed to find because it was not going to happen in a hospital. And certainly it wasn't going to be something covered by insurance. And so mm-hmm. it was really traumatic. So Monday morning, we called back to the specialist to let him know we'd made the decision to abort. And he wasn't in the office that day. It was another specialist. And she said, come on in and let's talk about it before you make this decision. We sat in her consulting room again and she, you know, listened to what we wanted to do. And she said, well, okay, it's your decision, but can you wait just a minute? I want to go look something up. She came back with a piece of paper and she was holding it in her hand and said, I found a study of babies with hydrocephalus that was done in Ireland, 140 babies that at 20 weeks were determined to have hydrocephalus. Of those 140, 40 would be considered severe, same as Daddick's case. Of those 43, 40 died. Of the 140, there was 30 something that had made it to term. Mm -hmm. And of them, many had died in those first few months, first few years. But one of the babies that had made it to term turned out normal. Wow. So I looked at Garen and I said, that is my miracle because it's science. Uh And I felt very much like Abraham and Isaac, the story from the Old Testament. Hmm. I felt whatever I had gone through that weekend to make the decision to abort him was mm-hmm. a huge sacrifice on my part because <laughs> mm-hmm. I couldn't do it. I could not see myself doing it, but I felt again, sustained in this decision, went forward to you know, take action. Necessary. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And then the doctor comes back and says, but in this study, science mm-hmm. has recorded and mm-hmm. here's this one normal baby in Ireland that hopefully I'll meet in the hereafter gave me hope. Mm -hmm. So I went home and said, nope, we can't do this. And I will tell you many prayers. Some days the prayers were, please just take this baby now. Mm -hmm. Don't let Uh me make this decision because it may be one of 140 babies, but where, which one was going to be mine. And by making the decision to go forward, I made the decision to have a vegetable. Uh So I went in every week for my checkups and the fluid continued to grow. My belly continued to grow. Dr. Anders was very concerned and was thinking that I needed to start sucking fluid out of my belly and sucking it out because he was not able to process the fluid because of the hydrocephalic condition. mm -hmm. So the fluid would just build up in my belly. Fortunately, there came a time near the 30th week mark that the fluid kind of stayed, which Mm -hmm. meant the baby's probably dying. Mm. And that's why I say fortunately, right? Because that's what I wanted. I wanted someone to make this decision for me. I mean, I remember having a conversation with my mom going, hey mom, I haven't felt the baby. Like, you know how you inform your bias sometimes? Uh Okay. But then you start to determine an outcome for yourself. And I wanted that. Mm-hmm. right? Like I wanted not to feel the baby kicking because I did not want this inevitable crisis. Right. Just did not know how I could do it. We made it to 36 weeks. We decided to have him C-section and wait and see. I still remember holding my husband's hand and walking into the hospital going, this is not in our hands. And when we were in the little pre-op room, and they strap that thing to your belly to mm-hmm. monitor the heartbeat the last few weeks. He didn't move a lot. Mm-hmm. And so I was prepping to birth a dead baby. But as soon as they strapped that monitor on him, my belly, it was moving everywhere. And the heartbeat was strong. Like 
I'm going, what are you, what are you saying to us right now? Like you're not dead and you are fighting something. And it was certainly manifestation to me that he wanted life more than his mom did at that mm-hmm. point. We all as moms have had moments where our babies are stronger than us. Right. Um, they don't have mortgages to worry about, right? <laughs> so he came out. I remember hearing him cry. And this is sad when you have a special case is that you don't even get to see the baby. Right. They literally just showed me his face and then put him through this little hole in the wall and sent him down to get testing. And uh Mm -hmm. you hear Dr. Andrews say he peed all over my (laughs) shoes, which I thought was ironic because he was the first doctor that said this baby's not going to make it. That is ironic. (laughs) Very cute. So this was hard, right? Now he's alive. He cried. It was tender. He wants to fight to live. But what kind of life is he fighting to live? All these unknowns. He had brain surgery when he was two days old to put the shunt in. They kept him there for just about two weeks, which was really surprising. But Dadek was doing really well. And still eight years later, he has the same shunts. And that's Mm. a huge, huge miracle. Shunts are not known to last very long. Um, They fail because Mm -hmm. they're a foreign substance in a human body. Mm -hmm. But that's a huge miracle to us. We took him home blind and deaf, right? He wasn't Mm -hmm. supposed to see. He wasn't supposed to hear. I remember recording in my journal that this blind baby Uh is looking at his mom. I mean, he sees me. Mm. He sees his sister. He sees his brother. And the seeing was amazing to me because how can mm-hmm. he be blind? And we took him home without optic nerves. The doctor saw yeah. no optic nerves. So we assumed they had not been developed. And since that time, he's got weak optic nerves, but they're there. And he has glasses and he hears beautifully. He's I'm very grateful for educators that believe that kids can learn mm-hmm. if they're given love and support. And he, memorized his alphabet when he was 18 months old. He's always had this beautifully articulate language. Mm. He does not understand very much. Like he doesn't have analysis. If you ask him why mm-hmm. something happens, he'll ask you the question that you just asked him. Uh-huh. He can memorize many lists of things. Like if you were to ask me, what's the miracle of this mm-hmm. story? Yes, there's medical miracles, but you and I both know the miracle is the heart. I still remember sitting in my library at my house and writing in my journal and you start to feel a darkness come on Mm -hmm. you and you start to feel a little sorry for yourself and you start to wallow. And the miracle of this whole continuing saga is that I felt lifted and I know it's because I opened up and shared this story with people around me and my community and my neighborhood so that people who believed in human connection and believed in a God and believed in prayers, bringing our intentions together to accomplish something. That was the accomplishment. That was the miracle. There's no tangible scientific evidence that when you pray for people that someone across the other side of the world is going to feel out of it. But I did. I can feel supported when I share my story with others. I can feel supportive as Mm -hmm. there's now been ladies with pregnancy and birth defect issues that I've been able to reach out and support Mm -hmm. and help through my story. I think fear can cripple. I think fear clouds our vision and keeps me on, you know, in the fetal position. It doesn't get me on my knees to pray and ask for help. So I try and avoid those experiences, but I have to prevent, I have to prepare. I write a lot. I journal a lot because I continue to journal about the things that Zadok has taught us. Zadok will ask, how's my aunt who passed away a year ago? Zadok will wake up in the morning and say, just these very tender angel conversation experiences that I just think our family is much more connected to people that we live by and people that have passed on before us because of Zadok and his experience. And I think he's just very much connected to the spirit world of cousins and friends and people that I think are on the other side and supporting us mm-hmm. and carrying us. Because I don't think we can do it on our own. I try not to be overly simple about this, but I don't look at Zadik as a special needs kid. I think my experience the last 
few months has been that I don't need to be his expert. I can just be his Mm -hmm. mom. That's been really hard for me not to look at Zadok as a problem to be solved, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a person to be loved. Mm -hmm. um, And that he, he chose me. I really believe that he chose me to be his mom of all the awesome moms like you, Liza out there. He chose this, (laughs) this infallible (laughs) mom. (laughs) Um, to help him through that experience. Mm -hmm. You know, as I saw your podcast on miracles, I think like on his birth announcement, we quoted a scripture that said, it is by faith that miracles are wrought. Mm. And I believe very much that faith is a hope for the tangible belief that I believe that Jesus Christ is my savior, not just, you know, to redeem my, my mortal self to live on eternally in God's presence, but to help me today, to sustain me, to support me, to encourage me. I believe very much that any pain that I have felt he bore for me. And while I can feel it sting, I don't have to take on its consequence. I don't Mm -hmm. have to bear it. I can give it to my savior and he can take that on. And I feel like this life is a time to be tried and tested. And the days I'm feeling tested are not great days, but I try to be reflective about it. Mm-hmm. I uh, start the day intentionally. I pray every morning. I read scriptures every morning so that I can ha- be a magnet for the good that I believe is out in the world. Mm-hmm. I believe there's more good than bad. Mm-hmm. I think Zadok keeps me humble. There's a lot of patience. I think the first thing we would all say that God is, is patient, right? And yeah. I think we're all here to become more like him. Yes. And experiences that try us help us to meditate more on who can I become from this experience? Mm -hmm. Yes, what can I learn from it? But what will I be more prepared to do with Mm -hmm. this experience? Many have called Zadok a miracle. Many continue to call him a miracle. I call him Z. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think there's a day that goes by that we're not grateful for him, that he doesn't make us smile, that he doesn't have us pull our hair out. Uh He doesn't cause me to worry so, so, so much. But gosh, if I were to look back and to talk to Jesse that's sitting in the consulting room of Dr. Anders's, I I mean, abortion never would have been an option, right? Yeah. Um, But as I've told this story, I say, please put a human face to something you see as a moral issue. Mindfulness, right, I think is, is a arm of spirituality. I believe we all have a power to choose our response response to a situation. But when I'm less mindful, I'm reacting. When I'm yes. more mindful, I'm responding because I'm giving myself the space to mm-hmm. pause and remember to breathe and then really meditate on who I know Zadik to be. And if mm-hmm. he's my great teacher, if he's my great um, example, if he's my great little angel, that can be forgotten when he's, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. fill in the blank with all the things. Right. <laughs> that little, <laughs> that beautiful boy full of refusal. So that's the ongoing saga of Zadok, but just that opportunity that I have to be part of a little boy who gives me hope, that gives me faith that I, there's no way I could do this by myself. Reaching out and sharing this story with others gives, I think, any story of hope gives others hope. So I hope that does something for those who hear this story through your uh, podcast. Right. And I really believe that we can be each other's miracles through those stories that we share, because it does offer hope to those that hear that. And that's one of the purposes of this, not to just notice the miracles in our own lives, which I think is powerful, but also to help share the miracles so we can be that miracle. In, yep. in someone else's life, that connection. And I do believe that too, that connection is one of the most beautiful reasons why we're here <laughs> is those heart connections. A gentleman got up in our church on Sunday and shared that their family's moving away and they've been in our neighborhood for many, many years and said that it's so interesting to me that sisters will drop anything to serve, mm-hmm. but to be served. <laughs> yeah. There's not a line for that. Like we have such a hard time being served and this was very hard for us to be able to say, Mm -hmm. we need help. And Mm -hmm. I think that's why we're supposed to be tried just a little bit more than we think we can handle so that Mm -hmm. it extends us. It forces us to ask. Mm -hmm. It forces us to share. It forces us to open up and to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I like that you say it's beautiful because it is. Mm -hmm. I think Mm -hmm. the more connections we make here in this lifetime, uh, there's a sweetness to that life story. There's a sweetness to the Mm -hmm. experience. Um, Unfortunately, it's usually trying experiences like this that force that hand for us to reach out and have that impact on others. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I think there is such divine orchestration in all things, that divine orchestration of, oh, what we're going to be experiencing and learning through these are really to help us grow and become who we're here to become. I think the Lord is interested in our growth. He's interested in our progress. I think we arranged before we came certain things and certain people in our lives and experiences in our lives to help us on that path and on that journey. I do too. I do believe that we were learners and studiers of experiences before Mm -hmm. we came to earth. I can't imagine that we were just sitting up there waiting in a line for our time. No. I think we were actively figuring Mm -hmm. out what experiences created what characteristics. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and how it would help us progress. Yes. Yeah. Um, Cause we are, it's, it's hard to remember that, but you know, our ability and competence grow with our effort and mm-hmm. here we are in this effort. This work has value for us. Um, yes. It's hard work and mm-hmm. we accomplish so much more together. We can't do it alone. Um, no. Yes. <laughs> I remember thinking all I wanted to do was for him to see his mom and when I'm bringing home a blind baby, the one thing mm-hmm. I've wanted, right. And so if God gave me that miracle, I am so grateful for him. Mm -hmm. But if God gave me the miracle of seeing what Zadok could become, I think that's far more miraculous than a pair of octopus nerves, especially Mm -hmm. if you look at this life to grow. I certainly have grown more in responding to his challenges than from being just given one miracle or one gift. Yeah, it's ongoing. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, thank you, Jesse, for sharing your journey and the things that you've learned and this miraculous experience. And it truly is a miracle that he is eight years old. Yeah. June 14th, he turns eight. So he's got a few more months and just know Liza, like it's over now. Like the miracle's over. There's no more. I'm kidding. Of course. Mm -hmm. Um, That right. right? I think that's what's miraculous is how our hearts change and how our mindsets change. So, yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much. This is beautiful. And I'm excited to share this and I know it will touch the lives of those that hear it. Thank you. So our next guest on the show is Adam from Idaho, and he has an amazing story of being led by a child. I think it was your three-year-old. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. It's quite an amazing example of the scripture in Isaiah eleven six that says a child shall lead them. So Adam, thanks for being on the show and tell us what happened. Excellent. Happy to be here. So on Sunday night, my family and I were driving through kind of uh, the rural areas of Southern Idaho, a lot of farmland. Um, it was right at sunset, really pretty time. We really just wanted to go and kind of observe God's beauty of the fall colors in the mountains. Um, nearby where we live. So we started driving up a dirt road farther than we've ever gone before. Uh, There's plenty of turns to go left to right. And my three-year-old, in order to help keep her engaged in what we were doing, uh, we had her give us directions of where to go. There's no particular place we're trying to get to. So she said, go left and go right. And the last time we gave her an option to turn, she paused. Mm -hmm. I remember that. And she was thinking, my wife and I thought it was so cool that she was considering which way should we go and looking back that's probably when she was inspired to pick a certain direction but she chose to go straight down this road instead of turning left and so we listened to her and we drove straight and we drove down the road for about 10 minutes at this point we're about 20 miles outside of town and really pretty far away from anybody else including other vehicles and houses or anything and we went around the corner of this dirt road and came upon two people and we slowed down because they were flagging us over. And I didn't understand what they were saying at first until one of them said, we're deaf. They were both deaf people. Really? Yeah. And at first I was thinking, oh no, like, I don't understand what they're saying. I hope they're like mentally okay. I'm really nervous. There's nobody else here. Mm-hmm. But then when they said they were deaf, I thought, okay, what can I really do to help these people? And they told us that their vehicle had flipped over just around another corner. And so we drew up and I got out of the van and i walked over to their vehicle, met them there, and they said they were just drifting around in the mud and then drifted too hard and rolled it, and uh, the cab was totally crushed. I'm not sure how they managed to get out, but there was no way they were driving that thing back. So I had them come over, and I got to know them a little bit and introduced them to my family and said they could sit on the floor of our van. We could drive back and help them, and we got a phone number of their friend, and the kids... (laughs) 
weren't too excited about two strangers in the car, but it felt okay. We, we said a prayer before we made a decision to help them, and uh, we felt it would be okay. And we, we contacted their friend, said we meet at a local church building. And so we drove them back down. And it was, a, you know, like I said, about a 20 minute drive till we got there. And, and then we met up with their friends and it was great. Lots of hugs. And we wished them well on their way. The next day I met with one of the friends that picked up the couple. And he told us he was so grateful and was shocked at how far away they were from anybody from help. And asked how we knew how to get there. And I said, it was, it was my three-year-old. She knew where to go. And she just was inspired by the spirit and by God. And we just listened to her. And he told me how much he, he appreciated that. And so I went inside and kneeled down to my daughter and said, there's some people that we helped out last night. And they said, thank you so much. And I want to tell you, thank you. And, and even though she's three, you could tell she, she knew that she had done something right. And that was really, really cool to see. That is really, really cool. Did, have you done something like this before where you've let her choose how to drive, which road to turn on? A little bit, yeah. You know, uh -huh. but it's, it's, been, it's been seemingly inconsequential before. You right, know? right. Not a big... But interesting that she paused for a minute and chose to go straight. Yeah. And I'm glad we listened because honestly, I don't want to go straight. There was another road I had been on that I felt would lead to this cool canyon. I wanted to go there instead. So, uh -huh. so, so I had to... You humble myself and just be willing to drive the way she wanted because it really wasn't a big deal where we went, but it turns out it was a big deal. It was a big deal. Such a big deal for those people. Absolutely. And, and how interesting that they were deaf, that they might not have been able to necessarily call for help. Were you in a canyon that you had cell service even? No, not at all. And yeah. It was yes, not only no cell service, we didn't have cell service took her a while driving out of there, but also it was very cold. It was getting dark quick too. So I'm not going to predict that, oh, we saved the day in it, in it kind of necessarily, but I don't know how I would get out of there without experiencing some serious health problems due to the cold. I'm sure you did save the day. I would go as far as to say that was divine intervention <laughs> and that you were there when you needed to be there. And who knows if they offered a prayer, please help us send somebody. Yeah. I'm, I'm sh I would be surprised if they didn't, <laughs> but... Who knows, but how neat that your daughter was tuned in enough to direct you there. I just think that's amazing. Has it made you think of anything as far as relationships with the Lord or as a parent? Any insights with this experience? You know, you hear a lot of stories. Well, I don't know, say a lot of stories, but you hear stories about people who pull over on the side of the road to help somebody and then like they get shot at or something or they get hurt, you know, and that's made me hesitant to want to help people that I see in trouble. You know, and I, I feel sometimes like when I make those decisions, like I'm the Levite priest or, you know, or the temple worker who goes past the guy on the side of the road instead of being the Samaritan. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we pray off for, as a family sometimes for opportunities just to, to be in the right place and to help people. And so I feel like this was one of those opportunities it was just we were in the right place at the right time. We we're able to help somebody out and do the Lord's will in a moment where he needed somebody to be there. That's beautiful. I do love that. Well, thank you so much, Adam, for sharing this story. It's such an inspirational story. I love it. Thank you. All right. Another show wrapped up. It was Lucky 13 show. Thanks both to my guests, Jesse and Adam. One thing I wanted to mention with Adam, his wife runs a blog and it's called Raw Motherhood. And it's just real life stories of the rawness of motherhood. And it's really cute and inspirational. So check that blog out. Her website, and I'll put it in the notes on iTunes. I'll spell it out. This is her website address. It's rawmotherhood.wixsite.com slash real life stories. Here we go. We're going to spell this out. <laughs> R-A-W-M-O-T-H-E-R-H-O-O-D. There's raw motherhood dot Wix site, W-I-X-S-I-T-E dot com slash real life stories, R-E-A-L-L-I-F-E-S-T-O-R-I-E-S. -E -E There's pictures of this little three-year-old and their family and their adventures. So check out that blog and uplift your day with more fun stories. As always, remember to support the podcast by sharing with your friends, subscribing to the podcast, giving it a rating and a review, 
go to iTunes. I have on my Instagram account how to do a rating and review on iTunes. Instagram handle is Wonders and Miracles. Follow me there. Check out how to rate this podcast. That is really one of the most powerful ways to spread the word because it gets us up in the charts and then more people can find us. I really do appreciate your help. Also, my giveaway all the month of November, another way to spread the word, go to my Facebook page, Wonders of Miracles, or my Instagram page, Wonders of Miracles, and follow the instructions there if you would like to receive a free Meditations on the Mount album. You can choose either the children's one or the regular one. Both are just beautiful meditations. So as a thank you for helping me spread the word, my desire to let the world know that the Lord is here, that miracles are happening, that his guidance is with us always. And I just think that's such an important message. When we seem to focus on so many bad things happening, I really want to call attention to the good things that are happening. So help me spread the word. I love that you are listening. Thank you for your support. And for my fan of the week, the review that I'm going to read today, this is a review on iTunes, a five-star rating from Crunchy Vegan Mama. She says, this podcast shares beautiful stories of miracles from the perspective of everyday people like you and me. Each episode is as unique as the person who shares it. And yet each story teaches me more about myself and the way God works in our lives. Sometimes I'm moved to tears, but always I am moved to give glory to God for his mercy, love, and grace. I love listening and feeling uplifted and edified. I look forward to this podcast as it has become part of my Monday morning routine. My only wish is that I could listen to new episodes every day. Thank you, Wonders and Miracles podcast. So thank you for that review and your support. Thanks for sharing the podcast with your friends and family on your social media It really does help. Remember in Isaiah, it says that a child shall lead them. And from the Facebook group Gifted Moms, while we try to teach our children all about life, our children teach us what life is all about. Thanks for spending time with me this week. I'm always so uplifted to share these stories, and I'm so uplifted to hear your feedback. And remember, if you have a miracle story to share, go to my website website at wondersofmiracles.com and submit your story. I'm always looking for more miracle stories and I hope you can think of a time when you felt God's love in your life and perhaps when you noticed a child teaching you. And as always, remember to notice and celebrate the miracles everywhere because the more miracles we notice, the more miracles happen. Mm -hmm.